Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, and welcome to this webinar on this very uh, important topic of good faith in construction contracts in Egypt. Uh, what does it mean? We are privileged to be uh, broadcasting this live from the Cairo Regional Center, International Commercial Arbitration. And I am privileged to have with me as a speaker, Dr. Uh, NG Sirag uh, to discuss this very important uh, topic. Uh, we'll st start first with the introductions. And uh, she is someone definitely who does not uh, need any introduction. Uh, Dr. NG Sirag uh, has a PhD from uh, University of Central Florida in civil engineering. She is known as the executive director in contracts and claims uh, in Oscom Construction. She's an adjunct faculty in the uh, construction engineering department at the American University in Cairo. And she is currently finalizing uh, the executive master's of law in the London Sc uh, School of Economics. She's a member of uh, CIARB Egypt, and she's a registered arbitrator in the Egyptian Ministry of Justice and in the Cairo Regional Center. Uh, she's a member and uh, industrial advisory board of AUC, and she has several publications uh, in construction management and uh, claims. And, uh, thank you so much, Walid, for this uh, very lengthy introduction. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a privilege to be here in Sersika and uh, being live uh, with you for sure in uh, conducting this very important webinar about good faith uh, and fair dealing. Uh, and I will have the honor to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Walid Nimr. Uh, Dr. Walid is definitely a very well-known academic uh, uh, and practitioner in the area of contracts and claims. He has a PhD from the University of Salford and uh, an LLM from Robert Gordon University. He is the Contracts Director of Hill International Africa. Uh, he's adjunct assistant professor at the American University in Cairo. Um, he is the vice president of education and training officer uh, in CI Arab Egypt. Uh, he was the past president and currently the vice president of AACE, International Greater Cairo Section. He's the country representative for the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation, the DRBF. He's an arbitrator, an expert, a dispute adjudication board member, and his publication on construction claims are um, very important uh, to all of us. Thank you very much, Inji. Uh, um, in the ad uh, to this event, Inji, you mentioned that the um, good faith is a mandatory uh, provision in the Egyptian civil code. And I believe uh, you were referring to Article 148 of the Egyptian Civil Code. Now, let's see what this article is saying. Uh, it says, basically, that the contract must be performed in accordance with its contents and uh, in compliance with the requirements of good faith. Notice here the word must. Uh, so actually, it's, it's, it's not really an optional thing. It's, it's, a, it's a mandatory thing. But then uh, let's look at the, if you look at the uh, second paragraph, it's not good. Good faith is not just enough. There's there's other provisions, uh, uh, namely the law usage, law of equity, um, that also run alongside uh, the contract uh, as a sequel to the contract. So uh, that's really a, a very significant legal provision around which this webinar uh, is based. Now, uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Angie, that there are also good faith provisions? and the uh, MENA civil codes? I'd assume that. Usually civil law jurisdictions have similarities, so I would assume, but to what extent? Well, it's a long list. Are you, are you ready for that? Sure. Okay. So we have good faith provisions in the Algerian civil code, in the Bahraini civil code, Kuwaiti civil code, Libyan civil code, Qatari civil code, list goes on, uh, Syrian civil code, Jordanian civil code, UAE civil code, the Moroccan code of obligations and contracts, Lebanese code of, of obligations and contracts, and also the Tunisian code of obligations and contracts. That's quite interesting. You know that good faith is provision is very much uh, popular as well, and it's present in international civil law jurisdiction. Do you want to know? Oh, please. All right, let me take you to that. Uh, it's present in the German Civil Code, in the French Civil Code, in the Italian Civil Code, and in the PECL. Okay. 
benefits. Okay, and in the principle of European contract law, uh, in the Union uh, principle as well, which is the principles of international commercial contracts. So, it's 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 common. That's quite interesting. And uh, now, before we go any further, uh, we would like to have a poll. So uh, just to know, uh, ask you a few questions before we go further. So uh, the first question is, uh, please indicate your uh, profession. Are you a contractor, an employer, engineer, lawyer, or, uh, or other? So just take a minute and uh, we'll resume our um, session once you uh, answer the questions. Well, that's very interesting. There are a lot of contractors on that uh, uh, webinar, and I can see uh, more as well. So uh, more engineers, that's very good. So there's some sort of equality between the contractor and engineer. Really. Yes, ex yes, exactly. Yes. Some employees are there as well. So thank you for attending, Mr. Employers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two, um, did you come across a solid definition of the term good faith? So let's take a minute for that as well. Well, uh, Angie, it's, uh, I think it's pretty much what we expected. 64% uh, uh, have answered that they have not come across a solid definition of good faith. Maybe this is why uh, we're also having this webinar. But what's surprising is that 36%, uh, uh, actually, it's more than I thought. Uh, they, ha they have come across a solid definition of the term good faith. That's quite interesting. We'll have a very interactive session then. That's right. Um, the third and last question uh, is basically... Uh, were you involved in any situation uh, in a construction context uh, where you felt that the principle of a good faith was violated? So there you, you've encountered a situation where you just felt that this was contrary to good faith in construction. Well, it's very interesting. 72% of the audience have experienced that violation, so and 28% have not. Um, that seems to be their good faith violation is present, or there is some sort of a misunderstanding of the term. So yes. let's go. Okay. So uh, let me ask you, Angie, uh, this question. Do you think uh, there is a good faith requirement in FIDIC contracts? Uh, that's quite interesting. I think before the FIDIC 2017, there was not any um, expression. Or, um, but um, I think in FIDIC 2017, it was very clear in the early warning uh, clause in 8.4. So. The early warning clause. So you, you're talking about uh, this clause, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so actually, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, look at this advanced warning clause. We have, it requires each party, the contractor and the employer, 
to uh, advise the other and the engineer. So actually those two parties will advise each other and the engineer. And also the engineer has a reciprocal obligation of advising those parties as well. Uh, advice of what exactly? Uh, advising uh, of any known or probable future events uh, or circumstances, which may, if you look at the four, uh, four factors uh, below, basically anything that ad adversely affects the price of the contract, the time of the contract, the contractor's personnel. Uh, so basically, uh, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Inji is that this is really, this exemplifies or signifies uh, how good faith is really, uh, how FIDIC actually now has incorporated good faith as part of, a, of a, as a contractual requirement. So not only if we are, if you're operating in Egypt or any of the civil law jurisdictions that we've mentioned, uh, not only is it a legal requirement, but it's also a contractual requirement if you're using the FIDIC 2017 contracts. I remember the ad where you mentioned good faith, good faith, but what does good faith really mean? That's, I think, this, Angie, that's, that's the million dollar question, actually. So uh, I think, what does it really mean? I don't think there's a uh, any defined definition, although I know that a lot of people have been trying to really come to grips with what good faith really means. I brought with me a book, actually, this is called Husn um, al-Niyya uh, fi Ibram al-Aqud. And that book, as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty lengthy book. Uh, it's by Dr. Shazad Aziz Suleiman. And uh, the book actually goes into the uh, historical origins of good faith that discusses good faith from a uh, common law perspective and uh, civil law perspective, uh, Islamic law perspective, uh, even international contracts perspective. Uh, unit draw and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but that's good faith in a global sense. Uh, recently, uh, there's there have been also the, the literature trying to describe uh, good faith and, and, and what it means in a construction context. For example, we have this article uh, in the New York Dispute Resolution Lawyer, which is uh, published in uh, spring 2020, which included an article by Dr. Um, Muhammad Salah. Uh, Abdul Wahab, which actually uh, is entitled Reflections on the Principle of Good Faith, Variance, Derivatives, and Related Issues in the MENA Region Jurisdiction. So actually, this is very specific. This is construction, and this is also MENA Region. And uh, what's significant about this article, uh, going back to your question, Inji, is that uh, Dr. Muhammad actually quotes 15 examples and variants of what may constitute, uh, what does good faith, uh, what, can, what uh, good faith is constituted of. So now, uh, if you are expecting a lecture, this is really where the lecture ends. Uh, from now on, it's an interactive session. So what we're going to do is we're going to present some scenarios from construction, and we will discuss them. And we want your also your active engagement uh, in these scenarios. So for the remainder of this webinar, what we will do is first of all we will uh, I will present a scenario, and then Dr. Inge will present a scenario, and. We have in store for you seven uh, scenarios in construction, and then uh, we will comment on it. Uh, so the presenter will present, and then the other person will comment on it, and then we'll open the floor for you to uh, give us your thoughts. We will just, for the sake of time, we will may, may choose one or two or three uh, volunteers to or from the attendees to to contribute. Uh, just bear in mind, you can contribute in two ways. Uh, the first one is you can open your, raise your hand and uh, you'll be called on. And of course, just bear in mind if that happens that you're uh, to keep your mic on and your camera on so that we can see you as you're, as you're uh, presenting your question. Um, the second uh, option is if you see the Q&A um, session, the Q&A, sorry, sorry uh, sign. So you can, you can post your question there and we will read the question and uh, answer it from there. Uh, and then we will wrap up, uh, basically, after this, the comments are, that are received, we'll wrap up that scenario and go to the next scenario. Just minor thing, Dr. Walid, a uh, very important disclaimer. Uh, the views presented in each scenario are based purely on simple facts. As you will see, these views are definitely subject to change based on the actual facts of the circumstances of a particular case and definitely the contrary conditions. So let's go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Angie. So, 
You ready for the first scenario? Let's go and okay. share with the audience. <laughs> All right, okay. So the first scenario really is uh, a scenario that is um, in the tendering stage, one that I encounter uh, very, very frequently. Um, so let's let's say this. Say that there is a contractor who submits a proposal with no reservations or exclusions. So here I am talking about specifically contractual uh, exclusions or qualifications. Okay, so the proposal submits this, this the contractor submits this proposal, and the other tenders uh, have submitted proposals, but and they do have qualifications or exclusions. Okay, so and, and because this contractor was apparently uh, compliant uh, in front of the and the owner's eyes uh, with the requirements by not submitting, you know, uh, qualifications and so on and so forth, the owner decides to award the contract to this contractor. Now, now this. Um, now, after this letter of award stage, as we know, we have a stage where we will negotiate the contract uh, to be signed. So now the contractor breaks his silence and now presents the, the uh, employer with 25 exclusions and qualifications, comments on the conditions of contract that, hadn't, that were not presented before. So uh, in effect, from my perspective, Dr. Engie, this contractor really put the employer in uh, against the wall, we put him in a corner because uh, the one of the factors that led the employer to choose this contractor is because the contractor was um, compliant, fully compliant. He did not have any exclusions or qualifications, but now all of a sudden he has a lot of reservations. So I, I would think that this is uh, could be an act of not an act of good faith, uh, because now the, the employer is cornered. What do you think, Dr. Inge? That's quite interesting. And Lee, I don't want to be a pro contractor, but there were uh, there could be several situations that can lead to that exclusion. Uh, let's, for example, take an example. For instance, he got awarded the project, but the execution happened um, maybe a year after the award. Eventually, out of good faith, the contractor wants to come clear to the employer and show him um, the exclusion, for instance, increase in price. Prices, his base price for his tender is not valid anymore to account for escalation per se. So, um, so this is, could be a very important exclusion. Another thing as well, the COVID, which we have all experienced uh, prior to COVID, if the letter of award was prior to COVID and then the award would happen during the COVID, uh, the contractor has to come clear as well in showing that there, is, there are going to be problems in the execution, in the productivity of his labor, in the uh, time for completion. So out of good faith, he listed his exclusion instead of submitting claims during the uh, project. So I would say that this is a very uh, good faith contractor. <laughs> Okay, so I see what you're saying. You're saying there's changed circumstances and that can really justify this kind of, of action. Okay, so now that really um, we would like to know your opinion, if you can uh, please uh, raise your hand or you can type your question in the uh, Q&A box. I can see some hands are raised, Dr. Walid. Uh, um, uh, a lot of hands are coming there. Really? I don't, I don't see any. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh, we can start. The first one in my list is uh, um, mm. Mr. Mm. Salah Fikri or Engineer Salah Fikri, if you uh, definitely would love to mm. know your viewpoint on that. Um, Hello, my voice is clear now? Very yes, clear. we can hear you, yes. yes. Yes, I believe it's not good faith because uh, the contractor, he submitted his offer and the letter of award submitted by the owner, it's meaning acceptance. So the contract now, it's already initiated because there is offer and acceptance. So after that, the contractor, um, he come to try to, his new letter with 25 uh, concerns, this meaning he tried to uh, cancel or, uh, yeah, he tried to breach the, the current contract. So it's totally bad faith from my point of view. Okay, thank you, Mr. Salah. Uh, 
we have uh, other um, any other raised hands? Uh, I can see some comments on the chat. Uh, there is no good faith, Mr. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Al Banna. There is no good faith from the contractor size as he waited to the award to present his exclusion. That's definitely very uh, valid. Um, Let's see. Uh, another person, Mr. Fi'i, he's agreeing with me. Thank you, Mr. Fi'i. Definitely depending on the circumstances and the conditions of the contract. Um, uh, oh, but, so we have it. Uh, it's one of a good faith action because of the early wording. So I think, I think also uh, Mr. Karim Shawi raises an interesting point. He mentions, what if there's no change in the circumstances? Um, so yeah, that, I think that's a, that's a key point. Uh, if there's no change in the circumstances, uh, from my perspective, at least even from my experience, uh, the really the employer is really in a, in a in a corner because, as you can imagine, Dr. Ng, this employer went to the board, he got the approval for a certain budget, and and then all of a sudden now he has. Uh, diff a different set of uh, uh, requirements, uh, exclusions that may affect the price of the contract. Uh, so, so thank you all for for contributing. Uh, you raised very valid points. Um, I think the, the the core thing really here is uh, uh, transparency in the in the form of good faith. So, if the contractor has any um, any like reservations, these should be for, uh, shared from the beginning of the project, from the beginning of the tender process, I mean, with the proposal. Uh, the fact that contractors submit a lot of qualifications in the tender, in my opinion, that's not a bad thing. Actually, that, that's a sign of transparency. Um, and also, in the, on the other hand, as Dr. Ingi pointed out, uh, owners should be open to uh, change circumstances. So if we have something, if, if COVID comes in the middle of the tender process or uh, or the tender, the, ten, the the time for signing the contract is, is unreasonably long, then then the, the owner also, the employer should be flexible enough to allow for um, for the contractor to provide any, uh, any concerns on the contract conditions because th this might change. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add, Dr. Inji? I think you got it. We have a lot of questions. I wish we can answer more. Uh, but let's go to scenario number two. And definitely we will try to answer your questions separately uh, and send it to you um, separately. Okay. Let's, me, let's go to question number two. It's somehow related to the tender. Um, the tender documents uh, for, uh, that were for a project, uh, as you know, most of the tender document include list of suppliers uh, and manufacturer for several items to be procured. Uh, for uh, one of the items, um, for each item to be procured, there were two, sub two suppliers, just for the employer to have some sort of a, a competitive pricing between those suppliers. For one of the items uh, that has two suppliers, one of the supplier does not manufacture such item anymore. So the contractor proposed another supplier and included him in the price, uh, not only the name, the price and uh, the name and the price in the tender. And he based his price on his choice. The contractor signed the letter of acceptance without any reservations. During the execution, the engineer realized that there's a change. Uh, there was an alternative supplier provided by the contractor, and he signed his letter of acceptance without any reservation. He said, this is bad faith. Uh, you, are, you are not allowed to go for your um, chosen alternative supplier, you have to go for uh, one of the items, uh, the suppliers listed in my Tinder document. This is bad faith, and you will not be allowed to use that supplier, which you base your price upon. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Walid? Is this bad faith from the contractor? Well, I just have one question in mind, because you mentioned that the contractor uh, proposed another supplier and included the supplier's price in the tender. Uh, but what did the contractor? So I understand from this that the contractor did not notify the uh, the employer that there will be this deviation. Uh, it's, he just included it in the in the in the tender, but did not uh, notify. And maybe this is what caused caused this uh, this problem because the engineer, uh, when uh, during the contract he received this this uh, uh, alternative, uh, he was maybe the, uh, caught by the element of surprise. Maybe if he had been notified, I mean, this this is my only. My only comment. Uh, 
I agree, Dr. Wadi, uh, he could have notified him, but maybe he just thought that just putting it on the documents would be enough. And for sure, the engineer will review each and every single line in, the, in his price. So probably it was an oversight by the engineer at the time of the award. And the engineer relied completely on the without reservation. So let's see what the audience thinks. Yeah, so what do you guys think? Let's see some raised hands. When it's just Dr. Reed, uh, 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 Chris. I think uh, Chris got disconnected. Okay. Uh, then. Uh, is it clear now? Yes, we can. We can hear. Yes. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, well, I think it's not that clear on the on the proposal uh, on his list clarification list or something. I think that uh, and it was written somewhere in the BOQ or something. It would be the uh, the event of default of the employer himself or the engineer who's working with the employer at the time of the evaluating of the tender. And uh, by such time, it's not that clear at all in the documents. I don't think that we would go with the contractor for this price. Uh, on the other hand, if you have written it somewhere and it was clear and it was the mistake of the employer of not noticing it, I think that he should have a space of, uh, of negotiation if this alternative is matching and the engineer shall study this alternative from now on in the, in the project and if it's okay and it's providing and com in complying of the technical uh, requirements, he should agree on it. And I think it can go for the both sides based on the presentation of such uh, uh, a name of the supplier or the manufacturers in the documents. That's an amazing answer, Chris. I wish you are my engineer in all of the projects. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, very good activity. Just the cooperation which me and Dr. Walid were discussing, um, mm. that uh, how we can we can come up in the middle ground if it's going to benefit the project. So that's definitely a very good exactly. um, action to be taken. Yeah, do you want to take another one, Dr. Walid? Yes, let's. Why don't we try, uh, Mr. Maher Maher Shalawi? Okay. I think he. I think we've lost Mr. Meher. Okay, then. Uh, uh, Ab Abdullah. Abdullah Akipinar. Mr. Meher, mic is muted. Oh, Mr. Meher is muted. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, can we take another? Uh, um, okay, we can look at the. Uh, we can look at the shots and the chats, see some. Yes. Oh, here. Uh, is he back? Okay, yeah, let's, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. let's take some of the shots. For instance, uh, Ms. Sara Wahba is saying, I think the contractor should abide um, with the engineer requirements to stick to the vendor list or try to convince him that such supplier would meet the same criteria, which is definitely a very good solution, Ms. Sara. Um, and, uh, and also... Uh, Hello? Yes, this is Abdullah Akbar. I'm sorry, maybe you couldn't catch my voice before. If I'm allowed to continue for the scenario number two, I have to add my comments if I'm allowed yes. to do so. Please go yes, ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, first of all, greetings from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, congratulations for this uh, wonderful event. Actually, uh, uh, I will be sharing this. It seems we have a technical problem with Mr. Abdullah. Um, uh, yes, we, we can't we can't hear you, Mr. Abdullah. Well, uh, if we if we uh, go to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmed Fuad, uh, over. can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, it seems that I am losing you. I don't know. Can you hear me right now? 
Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, go, go ahead. Okay. So uh, uh, since the uh, contractor has put a clarification in his tender and they have proposed another supplier since one of the approved suppliers does not manufacturing the item, I do believe that uh, for the benefit of the project, both employer and the contractor should agree on, uh, let's say, common grounds to accept another uh, uh, supplier. So uh, maybe the contractor signed the letter of acceptance with an oversight without putting any reservation, but for the benefit of the project and the good faith applies for both. I mean, both the employer and the contractor. So I do believe that there has to be a sort of negotiation between two parties and eventually the project will win. Uh, well, actually, Mr. Abel, you mentioned something that is, uh, I think, a, a golden words, which is for the benefit of the project. So actually, uh, I fully agree with you. Uh, I think that the, the the contractor and the tender and the and the and the engineer should really think of the benefit, the project itself. One thing that caught my attention in Dr. Inge's description is that she said that the one of the suppliers of an item does not manufacture. So actually, if you think about that, the the error could really be from the designer who uh, specified this this supplier who does not manufacture. So the contractor actually, in good faith uh, and being proactive went ahead and, and, and had another supplier um, ha had a solution, basically. So that's that's a sign of good faith. However, what we're saying is to eliminate this element of surprise from the engineer and cause this problem, the contractor should maybe, although it's in the tender, it's in the proposal, but the contractor should have really highlighted this, as you're saying, um, clearly from the start. And this, this transparency, I think, uh, like you said, for the best interest of the project, the engineer, the employer has to be more flexible and the contractor has to be more uh, forthcoming with the, with the notification so that there's, uh, we, we eliminate any, any of these disagreements. Now we'll, we'll go, go to the third uh, scenario. One more point, please, Dr. Wally. Yes. Actually, uh, we are now uh, in the international projects. We are seeing some bidder conference. Actually, this, uh, there could be an uh, argument from the, uh, let's say, employer side that why the contractor did not, let's say, uh, uh, argue this point at the time of bidder conference. I don't know whether the bidder conference is, uh, uh, happened for this project or not. If that would be the case, so there could be an uh, argument from the employer side that the contractor should notify this issue before submitting his bid. And if... Uh, uh, the employer is silent on the issue, then they can put, and they have the right to put a clarification in their tender. Thanks for this opportunity. I agree, Dr. Uh, Mr. Abdullah. It's definitely, there are usually some questions and answers before the submission of the price, and uh, the contractor should have submitted that question indeed for the, for the employer. And if um, he got no answer, then he should have uh, this exclusion. Yes. But, but I agree with you, whether in the pre-conference or the, pre the conference before uh, the submission um, or in the meeting or via a letter would have been very beneficial to solve that problem. Yes. So, so now we come to a scenario that's uh, very close to my heart a bit also. Uh, they're all close to my heart, but actually this one is, uh, again, has to do with uh, tendering and uh, construction. And so let's say that the tender is aware of a major design uh, omission. So there's a major design defect in the tender documents, but the contractor uh, intentionally, and I underline the word intentionally, does not alert the employer of the, or the engineer. So the, this contract, this tender does not uh, raise the question to say that, you know, this item is, is, is omitted from the drawings or is omitted from the BOQ um, and just lays low and submits the price. And the contractor is awarded the contract, but then after being awarded the contract, the contractor raises a request for information or an RFI querying about this uh, design omission. And of course, requesting a variation. And because it's a major design emission, this might take uh, a um, one variation or a series of variations to cover this emission in the design. Now, and of course what happens with, when you issue all these variations and there's a major cost overrun uh, by the uh, incurred by, borne by the employer. And that's because of something that the contractor could have uh, notified during the tender stage. Now, one uh, offshoot of this example of this is what we call the missing BOQ items. And that's something like in 
say if, we, if we're in a remeasured or a unit price contract where uh, the drawings and the specifications have clearly uh, a certain element of the design, but the BOQ does not have this element. And this is, say this is something that is very uh, apparent, very, uh, it's a major issue, but then the contractor chooses not to notify the employer and ask the question so that an addendum can be issued and a corrective, uh, you know, uh, corrective actions would be taken. And uh, this, of course, causes a cost overrun on something that was present in the tender documents. So the, uh, understandably, the, the engineer or the employer feels very frustrated for this cost overrun. So I don't know about you, uh, Inji, but I feel that this is really uh, could be a sign of bad faith because the contractor intentionally, uh, I mean, there's the contractor has a duty to seek clarification during the tender stage. And the contractor here intentionally chose to, to be silent and that silence resulted in this cost overrun. What do you think about that? That's quite interesting, Wally, because, you know, I'm working for a contracting firm and um, it's a remeasured contract you mentioned, right? So right. Um, the quantities are definitely the risk of Mr. Employer. So uh, I will leave the word intention on the side because it's very hard to prove the intention of the the party without any written documentation or anything. Um, for sure, we try for a remeasured contract, the drawings are important, but the takeoff is not as important as a Lamson project. So uh, out of good faith, I would just see that the contractor um, was not sure because you don't really know about the emissions or the mindset of the employer. So I don't see that as a bad faith actually, since um, uh, the employer going in a remeasured contract, know exactly, we should know uh, the risk of uh, the quantities. So uh, let's uh, take some opinion from the audience. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, what do you What do you guys think? Uh, we have some raised hands. Okay. Um, my engineer Chris is there, but let me take another engineer. I will just go for uh, Mr. Weel Azizuddin. I think he's coming on the line. You can hear me? I, we can hear you very well, Mr. Weir. Yes. So, thank you so much for this webinar. It's really uh, a great pleasure and honor to be in such uh, webinars. Uh, for my point of view, uh, there is always, uh, let us say, a mix of responsibility regarding the contractor responsibility and the owner and the designer. When uh, Mr. Walid is highlighting that it is a major design omission and while tendering the stage, that means it is not related to contractor responsibility as a contractor in this situation is uh, professional in executing the project, not in the designing. So um, from the beginning, it is not related to the contractor. This is as per my point of view. Um, for the contract uh, type that it is remeasurable, um, maybe the contractor is using his rights, how he uh, administrate and manage his contract with, uh, with the owner. That's quite interesting. I fully agree with you. Thank you so much. That's your answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Abdullah El Gindi. Maybe we're having a connection problem. Uh, we can go for um, Mr. Haytham Mukhtar. Dr. Uli, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yes. Well, thanks, Dr. Uli. Thanks, Inji, for this nice webinar. I, I hear in, fully agree with Inji that uh, this is not uh, a breach of uh, good fit from the contractor side. As number one, uh, we assume that this is a design issue and uh, we assume that this is not a design and build uh, contract. So in the first place, liability is on the engineer's side. And I agree with Inji that uh, who said that this intentional uh, misleading of, of, of the contractor was proved. 
uh, it's totally uh, vague and very hard to substantiate. But what point? What my point is that in most cases, uh, uh, the the contractor shall always have the right to issue RFIs regarding increasing quantities, omitted designs, or whatever, as long as it's not a design and build. Uh, and in most of the cases, a remeasured remeasure contract. Uh, thanks again. Thank and, you. And Dr. Walid, I believe that you come from an employer's background. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Yes. And it's obvious and I'm coming the engineer. from the other side. <laughs> Contractor, yes. but we're trying really here to be uh, uh, unbiased. Uh, but, 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 I, but I hope that you come from a, a, an employer's fair point of view. <laughs> I, I try to be. <laughs> I try to be. Keep trying. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, also, actually, uh, from the chats, we have uh, uh, Sarah Wahba mentions that I believe that the omissions are not in the favor uh, of the contractor. Accordingly, if the contractor was aware uh, of with such omissions, he will definitely notify the employer earlier to avoid losses. Please clarify the situation. Um, I think this is really uh, one of the, the, of course, we're saying that, of course, the contractor in a, in a construction contract does not, is not responsible for design. Uh, however, what we're talking about is if the contractor was aware, so if, if the contractor as an as a, as a experienced uh, professional was aware of something uh, and he had the option to ask the question, uh, should, he, should he have asked the question or not? We're not saying he assumes liability or not. So this is uh, maybe uh, this is something that is that is being highlighted here, and of course we have to be a good faith mandates that uh, we are reasonable. So neither the employer should bear uh, losses that could have been prevented. Uh, as actually Sarah, as as Sarah mentions, um, if the contractor would notify earlier, then that's what, this could avoid losses. This is this is the key thing. This is, that's an act of good faith, actually, on the part of the contractor, and which I believe the advance warning uh, would play a part here. Um, and on the other hand, the the employer also should not, uh, the contractor is here for to make a profit. So, and this is, as you mentioned, it's a remeasured contract, and this is in the, in the first place, this could be a design issue. So the contractor, the employer should take also uh, some uh, responsibility. So maybe a middle ground solution would be in in in, uh, in call here. What do you think, Doctor? Uh, I fully agree. But there's a very interesting question that me and you, Doctor Reed, were thinking of. Uh, of Mr. Mohammed Aymer was talking about: Does the Egyptian civil code require good faith in the pre-contract negotiation stages? In the case with the French civil code reform in 2016. So that's quite interesting, Mr. Aymer, because. Uh, um, good faith is present in this code, uh, but definitely it's very important um, to show uh, the good faith in the negotiation stage, in the pre-contract stage, which I personally have experienced um, in cases under the civil code. And um, to show good faith is that you, um, you show some sort of um, evident that you were, for instance, if you were going in a project, uh, that you were serious about this project, um, uh, if, for instance, that you're asking for some sort of damages when the contract is not, uh, um, when a tender is not going to go through, um, that should last some opportunity. So definitely uh, the good faith should be present in all of the uh, stages of the contract. Uh, the civil code is just talking about good faith in general, right? Yes, I believe that uh, good faith is an overarching principle, actually, that goes in all, as, as Dr. Inji mentioned, and all covers all stages of the contract. Now, uh, shall we take the, uh, the next scenario? Yes. That's the one that's very close to my heart, of the time bars. <laughs> close to all of our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, if we can just take a seat uh, to that one. Um, in a progress meeting, um, the employer mentioned that consideration is given to, to issue variation. A contractor verbally alerts the employer that a variation, if instructing, will have a substantial cost and time impact. The variation is instructed. The contractor presents a notice of claim after 45 days. Employer responds that the claim is time barred. The contractor asserts that the employer is fully aware from the progress meeting. What do you think, Dr. Reed? Um, the employer argues that the contractor's silence constituted reconsideration of contractor position and there are no impacts. What do you think? Uh, well, actually, uh, in this case, uh, the uh, I believe that the first of all, uh, and of course now going back to the thing of me trying to be a fair 
uh, employers uh, of an engineer, I would think that uh, fairness dictates, and actually there's a lot of, I think, literature written on the fact that if there is knowledge, so if the employer has knowledge of something, even if it's not in writing, then uh, that knowledge, uh, it would be contrary to good faith uh, that uh, the, the employer would, would uh, actually reverse, you can reverse positions and say that, uh, no, you're, you're, it's time barred. Because how about the, the, in the employer, the contractor told the employer in a meeting, although verbally, uh, that uh, this is something that is, um, yani it's, it's a, uh, has, an, has an impact, just know that beforehand. And the employer chose to issue the variation anyway. So therefore, the owner has knowledge and it's contrary to good faith to uh, apply the time bar. Uh, and actually, in the 2017 contract, in the claims procedures, I think they actually there is reference uh, in there to the, in the claims procedures to having knowledge of the claim. So that's one of the differences also between 2017 and 1999. However, I think the last point here, the uh, last bullet uh, that Dr. Ng read is, is significant. When the contractor, uh, I mean, there, there should not be any justification for a contractor to not present formally uh, after receiving the variation, not, re uh, not presenting formally that this, what the, the impact is or uh, presenting the uh, notice. Because this, uh, this silence, as this last point uh, refers, can be, re can be understood uh, by the employer to mean that the contractor has, uh, and I would actually add in good faith, the contractor actually has reconsidered the issue and has is going to take measures so that there is no time impact or there's no cost, there's no, uh, the, the impacts are mitigated, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's why when, when there is no uh, notice, the contractor sh should have presented the notice because again, uh, that would uh, put the, really the corner, the, the, the employer in a corner because notice here in your third bullet, you mentioned that the variation uh, is instructed and the contractor completes the variation. So really the, the, the employer is maybe put in a corner, I think so. That's quite interesting. And maybe being the contractor, sometimes it's missed, the notices are missed. and. Um, and sometimes as well, the contractor are thinking uh, it's a civil court jurisdiction. We're going to rely on good faith. There is an actual damage incurred. So if there's an actual damage incurred, I'm sure if we go to arbitration, the arbitration is going to the arbitrator is going to rule uh, in the favor of the contractor because he's actually um, incurred the damages. And there were case precedents uh, in Sersica, actually in the center, that it, it's indeed not because the content has to be performed as it is. Uh, as it said, if there is a notice, it has to be serving as a notice. So um, I think in that uh, specific example, um, the uh, contractor has to submit his notices provision. He should not rely um, uh, on good faith, but maybe the knowledge is an important aspect. But I mean, um, mm. completely relying on, on good faith is not encouraged. But having the knowledge is, is definitely something that um, the engineer should consider. Uh, but to prove if this case goes to arbitration, to prove that he has the knowledge will be a bit hard. Yes. Uh, let's see what the audience think. Yes. So, what do you, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, I think Mr. Parsons has his hand uh, raised several times. Mr. Andrew Parsons, if you can uh, participate with us in that. Hello? I'm Mr. Parsons. Can you see me? We can see you or we can hear you, yes. Okay. I'm not sure I can see myself. Yeah, well, not, now we can't see you. So we, we, we saw you. <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead. So, so go ahead, Ian. What do you think of the case? Uh, I, I had an overall view, really, about because um, I work in different jurisdictions. So sometimes I, um, both as arbitrator, sometimes as counsel, there's a conflict between civil jurisdictions and common law jurisdictions. So I get I'm, I'm, that's why I've attended this, by the way, this, this is a very interesting topic. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's really um, it's great that it's you doing this. But I, you're talking about civil codes and that is in, entrenched in your law. In the common law jurisdiction, 
I think there is a, an idea that somehow somebody needs to be fair how they deal with their contract, but it's not entrenched. It's not, it's not coded right. So that's where I often find that there's a conflict between lawyers and the parties, especially in international contracts. So, so they have different perspectives about, I'll give you a question for you. What's fair? <laughs> What's fair? Hmm. Fairness is a, a relative concept. So yeah, it's kind of um, what's fair for one party is not fair for another. And uh, although, although under uh, dare I say, under Napoleonic code, when uh, civil jurisdictions developed under the French jurisdictions, um, quite right to do that. By the way, I quite like it in a way uh, that you're trying to say it's actually a fundamental principle that parties should behave fairly. What's wrong with that? As an English lawyer, I think, well, why, why don't we have that in our law? But we don't. Yeah, so that's all I say. But, but I come back to the point where fairness is a relative concept. Yeah, I'd love to hear what people think, not just me, but anybody participating. What's fair? What, 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 what do you think is a, what's fair, what's not? Mm -hmm. Great, let's see somebody. Th thank you, thank you. Uh... Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Al Jariri. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Yes. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm uh, outside in the car. Thank you for this interesting uh, lecture. Uh, regarding this uh, scenario, actually, uh, it's yes, uh, interesting uh, scenario and uh, it's re repeated um, uh, uh, a lot and a lot in the construction. Um, regarding the time bar, actually it's a contractual term and as per civil law uh, provisions, the uh, contract sh shall be executed as mentioned in the contract. So in, at that, uh, 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 as per this provision, uh, yes, we have to apply the uh, time bar provision uh, at the time of executing uh, the contract. Actually, the employer, there is uh, uh, good reasons, actually, uh, we faced in the projects. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the employer needs the uh, the contractor feedback on this affection because maybe he would, will withdraw that. Maybe the time, it will not suitable to him, the uh, cost, maybe he cannot afford that cost. So if you tell the Mr. Employer, since as soon as possible, uh, dear employer, this variation may cost uh, X amount and a certain time, he will say, okay, no, I don't want. Give me the project as it is. Maybe uh, later on I will do. That will, uh, uh, that will conflict with my visibility uh, for this project. So at the project uh, time, I would the employer to insist on uh, the time barring closes. If we went to arbitration or the court, the court uh, will, will apply the justice will say that what the contractor excuses, why he did not submit within 45 days, and what the amount of this variation, if it will uh, uh, make unjust enrichment or it will, uh, uh, will affect the profit uh, or make the contractor bankrupt or out of the market, then, so I believe the court or the arbitral uh, tribunal, uh, they have different way they, how they handle these cases, but at the project and contract execution uh, time, I'm with the Mr. Employer. I will apply to my contract as uh, uh, my projects need that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, you raise a very valid point um, uh, and one that actually I raise commonly uh, when, when discussing uh, time bars. 
uh, of course, I think that uh, you agree with me, uh, Rastrangi, that actually this this scenario in itself can merit a whole event uh, by itself, the, the issue of, of time bars. Uh, there's just one thing I wanted to uh, highlight, and that is the principle of estoppel. So estoppel is known in the uh, civil and the common law jurisdictions, and not so much in the Egyptian civil code and the other MENA region civil codes. Um, but uh, just, for, uh, just for your information, estoppel uh, is basically, in, in this scenario, the, there was a, a meeting, uh, there was uh, ex exchange of verbal, you can say, communication between the employer and the contractor. The, the contractor verbally informed the uh, employer that there will be an impact and the employer chose to, to, to send the, the variation anyway. So the contractor relied on uh, that, that he informed the employer. And so the employer knows, so the employer, the fact that he sent the variation means that the employer will compensate the contractor. So of course the contractor's shortcoming is that he did not follow this with a, a written notification as per the contract, but the contractor did rely on the uh, employer knowing, and therefore, if the, con the employer decides to apply the uh, contract time bar, then this will be to the to the contractor's detriment. The contractor will can, may suffer a loss, and this is really <clears throat> what estoppel is all about. Uh, the point that we want to mention here, if estoppel is really in the in the common law jurisdictions, then it is really a variant of good faith. Uh, in our jurisdiction, in, in the civil law jurisdiction. And actually this point is one of the points that were raised by uh, Dr. Muhammad Sabah in the, in the article that we, we've mentioned. So with that in mind, uh, we can now go to the, um, the next scenario. So uh, in the next scenario, let's say that, and this is also one that is uh, very, very, very uh, common. <laughs> I can't say how many times uh, I've encountered this, and it has to do with the claim detailed particulars. So now we'll move from the notice, and now let's go to the detailed particulars. Um, so the contractor receives uh, an instruction in an RFI, instruction from the engineer, and the contractor perceives this construction to be to constitute a variation. So the contractor serves the notice within 28 days, uh, telling, informing, and complying with the contract, uh, with the time bar provision that, you know, uh, Mr. Engineer, uh, this instruction constitutes, constitutes a variation. And the uh, contract requires, as, as you know, that uh, the detailed particulars would be submitted uh, within a certain period from the notice. And as we know, uh, in, in the FIDIC contracts, for example, there is no time bar for the detailed particulars, but there is for the notice itself. However, the contractor, so by this stage, the contractor submitted the notice, he... Uh, did not still submit the detailed particulars. However, the contractor went ahead with the uh, variation and completed the work. And then after three months from the notice, the contractor uh, submits the detailed particulars as is common with a lot of contractors. He submits it in a, like a, um, a, a, compiled, a compiled submission that has several other events as well. So this is, let's say it's, com it's commonly uh, like EOT extension of time number one submission, and there's number two, and there's number three after several months. So this submission is is rolled with a lot of other uh, impacts, and and from it uh, the employer or the engineer learns that this has result results this uh, this instruction in the RFI results in a four months time impact and associated prolongation cost, of course. Now, Dr. Inji, again, I, I feel. Uh, that this is again, uh, uh, I would I would say, contrary to good faith, that the uh, that the the con the the contractor waits for the detailed particulars is actually it's actually exactly what Mr. Uh, Al Jariri mentioned. Uh, but if the contractor had submitted uh, promptly uh, that this RFI instruction will uh, result in a four months time extend attention, then actually what would have happened, and I'm saying this from my experience as an engineer, we would have gone to the employer telling him, look, this, is, this instruction has to be, actually wouldn't even have gone to the employer, we would have gone to the designer and said that this is, this is not valid, we, we withdraw this instruction, for example. Um, 
so what, what do you think about about this scenario that's quite interesting because uh, i face this problem a lot <laughs> um yeah. and and let's go backwards this contractor has served his notice he followed the contract but for the particulars um there are no damages under the contract in most of the FIDIC contracts per se. So he has not, uh, under the contractually speaking, there are no damages of submitting your particulars uh, at a later period of time. But, but now, uh, uh, giving the bomb to the employer that there are, after, after finishing the variation, he just give him the time and cost impact. I would see really sometimes this is a, a good faith from the contractor and uh, I'm sure some of the uh, employers are just saying, ooh, she's poor contractor. It's, it's really because sometimes we're really eager about the project. We want to finish the project on time, um, whether it's a variation or not, uh, we want to get it finished because remember uh, having a contractor staying prolonged um, is another uh, issue of additional cost, additional indirect, and definitely the contractor wants to do more projects. So, so I would see that as a very, um, actually a very active contractor who is very eager to finish his project, uh, not just worried about the time and cost. And uh, once this variation is finished, is um, I'm sure the employer knows that there, each variation would have a cost of time. Uh, nothing is for free, Dr. Ali. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so, so maybe they will argue about the duration and the cost, but for an employer instructing variation and going in this, thinking that there will be no cost in time, definitely this is something that I don't think contractually will be um, uh, entertained if this goes to a uh, dispute board or, in, or arbitration. So that's my key point. Okay, so let's see uh, what, uh, what the uh, attendees think. Uh, do we want to go with Mr. Ihab Youssef? What do you think, uh, Mr. Ihab? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we, yes, yes, we can, yes. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, I... Mr. Ihab, you're, you're muted, I think. Now, now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, in, in this case, I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Inji uh, because uh, as, uh, later, uh, as Dr. Walid uh, was saying, the FIDIC has no uh, duration for submitting the particulars, which has some logic to it because in many cases, the contractor is, is compelled to, to be delayed in submitting the particulars because Actually, the 14 days is, is a very short time to uh, to evaluate a variation according, of course, according to its uh, extent and size. But in most cases, the contractor cannot uh, submit the detailed particulars in this duration. And uh, actually, the, the the employer is issuing a, a new instruction or a, a variation in, in an RFI uh, with, shows that the employer was trying to uh, to to give so, the 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 contractor some additional work inside some document that is not uh, actually for this purpose. If if the employer wanted to to be clear and have have good faith, he would he would just instruct the the variation in a in a clear instruction. So in this, I I totally agree that the the contractor was acting in good faith, was acting normally. It is neither in good faith or bad faith. He was acting normally. However, if the employer rejects this, then the employer seems to have had a, a, a bad intention from the beginning, trying to, to execute the variation without giving the contractor uh, what he owes him. Very good. Thank you so much for this. I think it's a very valid answer. Uh, it's a valid answer, although I have uh, a bit of a reservation. Uh, of course, uh, we do not say that the employer will reject. Of course, that would be completely unreasonable. However, uh, depending on you know, the, 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 thing that, the thing that I think is very critical, especially in the Egyptian civil code context, is has harm been caused to the employer as a result of the contractor? Because if you notice, uh, even if there's no um, bar or time bar uh, on the there's no consequences on the detailed particulars however uh, there is a contract and the contract has some procedures and the contractor signed to these procedures so if 
by not complying with these procedures, there's harm caused to the employer, uh, then that's, that raises, I would think, a legal issue and that the employer really has to substantiate this, uh, this harm, especially that this, these are procedures in the contract that should be complied with. Um, I just want to mention here, because I, I see uh, there's a question by Mr. Mohammed Mahdi in the chat, uh, if the contractor's verbal alert, I think this was uh, in relation to the previous scenario, was documented in the meeting minutes, um, would that be considered a notice um, even before formally receiving the variation? Uh, my opinion is that this is can be considered a notice. Uh, however, in the FIDIC 2017 contract, bear in mind that the word notice is defined. So actually notice has certain very specific requirements are not in the in the FIDIC uh, 99. So that's, that's another, I think that would be a... Uh, uh, I agree, Dr. Walid, in relation to Mr. Mohammed Mahdi, because I've always been trying to rely on progress meetings, on, uh, on any letter, not to necessarily saying it's a notice, and just rely and say, this is my notice. So mm. just to have some sort of, uh, to save myself from uh, the 28 days of the notice. Um, but for the 2017 is quite strict. So I think the notice provision or the word notice have been mentioned more than 50 times in 2017. So yes. it was a lot of burden for the contract administrators administering 2017. So that's quite important to note. So very good. Uh, can we go to uh, scenario number six? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, such as uh, scenario number six is very important. I, 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 I'm having a lot of uh, cases uh, actually uh, um, currently that I'm handling, uh, having this scenario. Uh, the contractor sends a request for the engineer to take over the work. The engineer refuses to take over the work due to some work still uh, being outstanding. The contractor argues that such items do not impact the internal purpose of the project and that refusal to take the over is causing unnecessary costs. The engineer is insisting that a taking over certificate will not be issued. And eventually he wants the contractor to be beside him till the last second of the project. So, so uh, um, what do you think, Dr. Ready? This contractor has finished and only pending punch items that will not hinder the operation. Shouldn't he give him the takeover certificate? I uh, I absolutely agree that uh, if the items were uh, not affecting the intended use of the project, and I, actually I would add, uh, and I'm sure you've experienced this, uh, Dr. Inji, but sometimes even the uh, the employer would go further as to actually occupy the project and use the project. Uh, in that case, of course, uh, I would think it's a, it's a not uh, it's not good faith to uh, insist on not issuing the taking over certificate until the and of course holding the retention until uh, that time because that can cause harm to the contractor. But I think that the key question here, really, and the debatable question is, the contractor in your scenario says argues that such items do not impact the intended purpose of the project. However, uh, there may be a situation where the employer disagrees with that. That says that, no, I, I, it does impact because I need this safe, this part that has to be completed. Uh, so and basically, I, in a nutshell, I would agree with you if it is established that these remaining items um, uh, really uh, do not uh, impact the intended use of the project. Although actually I have to also say that even if they did, uh, there is a procedure in the contract that the contract, the employer can, the engineer can notify the contractor to, to, to rectify within a certain period of time. And if the contractor does not, then simply deduct these amounts, uh, but don't hold indefinitely uh, the retention or the issuance of the TOC. So, very good. And actually, just to add, you know, there is a, a law provision in the Egyptian Civil Code that says if the building is ready for its intended use, then it's deemed to be taken over. So. And Mr. Contractor can rely on that and just consider himself taken over under the law. So it's a tool that sometimes contractor can use. Yes. Um, but let's take what the think what the, Absolutely. the audience would think. Let's yes. have some viewpoints. Please share your thoughts. Mr. Uh, Mustafa Halimi.
we lost Mr. Hilmi. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, now he's he here. here yeah. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we, we can. can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, I believe this is uh, this is uh, the point. This scenario is very critical, um, and I believe um, the employer um, resisting to, to to take over the ports uh, partial. Uh, the project, uh, it's uh, yeah. From my point of view, it's a pure uh, uh, bad faith uh, situation uh, because, as we, uh, as the scenario is saying that it's uh, uh, the contractor finished uh, the works for the purpose intended uh, for. Um, I believe um, the employer can uh, have a partial position, not, would not affect his um, uh, his contractual position or his liabilities, and also can uh, uh, remove the burdens on the contractor uh, that's being uh, um, harsh by continuing uh, operating, maintaining, and securing uh, the facilities or the parts that is being uh, finished without being handed over. Maybe it's some kind of, uh, that there must be a compromise. Uh, this compromise can be for the benefit of, uh, of both parties. If the employer insists on not uh, uh, handing over or taking over such uh, parts, uh, I believe he's uh, causing um, um, uh, damages to the contractor and this uh, breaches the, or this uh, breaks the, the contractual relationship because the employer is making uh, uh, damages to the contractor. Uh, also, I believe going back as Dr. Inji was saying uh, to uh, article 655, uh, if the contractor um, finished the works and the employer uh, rejected the taking over for um, uh, for not uh, uh, a logical reason, it's deemed to be handed over to. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. Do you want to take another one? Thank you. Uh, actually, we, uh, from the chat, we have uh, Mr. Hussam Abdul Hay, uh, who uh, mentions that it is not good faith to reject the issuance of a taking over certificate in scenario six. The engineer can give a grace period for the contractor to finish the remaining works, then deduct them if not done. So basically, what uh, Mr. Hassan is saying is that really, uh, as we mentioned, there is no justification to really hold uh, hold this, you know, the TOC. There is another a remedial action, which is uh, give the contractor the time, the grace period, as, as Mr. Hassan mentions, which is actually already in Article se uh, Clause 7 in the fitted contract. And then if he does not do it, then deduct or have another contractor do it at this contractor's cost. But to hold it indefinitely, that's that's a something that does not really have a solution. I fully agree. And just to add to uh, Mr. Hassan's question, it's very important that you define the grace period, Mr. Hassan, because uh, the word grace period could have a, a lot of uh, definition. Is it delaying the application of, uh, of LDs or is it an additional time that you uh, can have an extension um, beyond um, the original completion date? So definitely, if you're going to have a grace period, uh, uh, um, on your uh, contract or in a memorandum of understanding your settlement agreement, just make sure that you define a grace period so that you and the engineer and the contractor would have the same understanding. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Ng. Uh, we have now come to the, uh, you could say the final uh, scenario. Um, and really this is a, uh, before we go, we go there, I just wanted to alert that just as we mentioned in the time bars provision that uh, the estoppel principle ap uh, applies in this in the common law jurisdictions and that as we mentioned the estoppel is really a variant of good faith in the civil law jurisdictions this scenario number six can be construed as an abuse of a right uh, or an unlawful exercise of a right under the uh, civil uh, law jurisdiction in Egypt. This is this would be Article 5 of the Egyptian Civil Code. And again, uh, as Dr. Muhammad Salah mentioned in his article, that is also, again, a variant of, uh, of good faith. So that's, again, this is where good faith comes into play, whether it is 
uh, estoppel, whether it is abuse of a right, all these things are, would be contrary uh, to uh, the abuse of right would be contrary to good faith and estoppel would be it's an equity principle that, that applies good faith. Now, the, the seventh, this is the last scenario that we have uh, for tonight and we've approached actually an hour and a half. We're very pleased with the interactions that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've had in this, this webinar. Now, this is maybe a bit of a, I would not say it's a bit of a complicated, again, it's again, dear to my heart, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, a scenario that is a bit complicated and a really we, we'd like to have uh, some of your views on it. And it has to do with delays and liquidated damages. So imagine this scenario that the contractor is in delay. So there's no question that the contractor is in delay and the contract completion date is approaching. Okay, so then the employer issues a variation because the employer knows that the contractor is already in delay, but he issues the, the variation 15 days before the contract completion date. And this variation takes 30 days to complete. So if you can imagine this variation is issued, now the contractor to complete this variation, it, it will pass the contractual completion date, okay? But the contractor was, was delayed in the first place, okay? Uh, the employer issues the variation, uh, however, the variation is, is not issued with any extension of time, okay? So it's just issued and, and it practically, practically takes 30 days to complete, extending beyond the contractual, contractual completion date. Now, when the work is completed after two months, and I mentioned two months because, as we mentioned, the contractor was already late, but then he completed the variation and he completed the, the works that the, he had to complete, the employer applies liquidated damages because the, uh, the contractor was late, okay, was, was in delay. So here, the contractor and the employer are arguing. The contractor mentions, as you can see here in this picture, you issued a variation knowing well that it will extend the contractual completion date. So yeah, true, I, I was late, but you issued a variation that, um, that definitely affected the contractual completion date and that resulted in a negative float. So uh, although there is a negative float, uh, maybe the, the negative float due to this variation is less than that of the contractor. However, Mr. Employer, you issued this variation at a very critical time. So this, I would not have completed the project on this time in part because of this variation. The employer on the other hand mentions, you were late anyway. So my variation did not affect the forecast completion date because if we take the, the position before I issued the variation, the forecast completion date was not gonna be on this contractual date. It's gonna be uh, beyond that date. So you can see here that the contractor is referring to the contractual completion date as the base, whereas the employer is referring to the forecast completion date as the base. And this theory, this uh, uh, contractor's argument is what is really called, is based on a negative float theory, and the owner's is based on the longest path theory. So this, the, the reference points are different. Um, actually, this point is, this, this scenario is very, um, is very, very crucial that we actually, we dedicated uh, previously a, web, web, a whole webinar on it. Um, and we had it phrased in a, in a, term, in a, in a form of debate. Um, so my question here to you is the employer's silence about applying LDs at the time of the variation. So the empl employer issued the variation, had did not mention the con to the contractor at all that LDs will be applied and that the, the employer is thinking of the forecast completion date or anything like that. Uh, and the employer did not even extend the completion date uh, for the variation. Um, so if the, is the con employer's silence about applying LDs at the time of issuing variation a sign of bad faith or not? Um, what do you think, Dr. Engie? And then we can open the floor to... Uh... That's, that's quite interesting. I'll tell you my perspective. And uh, when the contractor is delayed toward the end of the project, definitely he's expected to pay LDs. And uh, when he gets a violation order to the end, that's... It's like an escape goat for the contractor. Hey, perfect. I'll just mm. hide my delay on that variation order and I will be relieved. And let's discuss uh, the apportionment of uh, the damages and see who's going to be responsible. Uh, well, um, sometimes uh, the employer would come and say, hey, but your delays are far exceeding the variation orders. So, so you will get empties. Um and the contractor, usually there's another counter argument from the contractor and say, once I know that there is a variation order, I started to relax my resources. So uh, a lot, uh, I can tell you a lot of disputes 
that goes to arbitration happens on for that particular period. So mm. um, your, your questions about the negative flow theory and the longest path theory and your webinar was amazing. And I, I think Thank you have a publication you. about that, that definitely I encourage everybody to read it. But, but it's definitely very important to understand those two theories to avoid disputes uh, in construction. So let's uh, take how uh, what the audience think. Yes. And, um, you can follow up on that. Uh, uh, let's run the poll. Well, actually, this was not in the in the poll, but uh, this is open for discussion. Uh, Mr. Omar uh, uh, Abdul Adir. Uh, good evening. Yes. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me now, Dr. Ali Dupenji? We can hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for such an amazing webinar. However, uh, uh, in respect of uh, this issue, I do have a point of view here. Uh, in 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 the uh, um, a part of uh, the longest path uh, theory or the negative uh, or the negative flow, uh, the cross or nay basis approach in the evaluation of the entitlement, I have another point of view. Uh, the employer here is aware, certainly aware, that his project will be delayed as a consequence of such variation, and uh, it's apparent that. Um, he, as an employer, is aware that um, he's not going to benefit from the project uh, at the near future, considering that he is already running further variation or changes in it. Uh, here, in, in my point of view, since he did not uh, notify the contractor uh, that he is facing issues and uh, he would apply delay damages if the contractor did not uh, complete within the time for completion or uh, because of uh, the contractor delay, I think there is uh, what we call here uh, a default in al uh, He did not. Um, he did not give um, uh, 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 a space for the contractor or a notification for the contractor that he is suffering damage due to the contractor delay. His actions are uh, contradicting this. His uh, his instruction. He's instructing variations, and therefore, uh, as um, as we know uh, in the Egyptian uh, civil code. In case uh, the contractor could establish that uh, there is no damage uh, um, on the part of the employer as a consequence of the delay, and the employer is making variations at such late stage, therefore, I believe it will be an act of bad faith if the employer uh, insisted on applying delay damages, uh, while his actions are basically showing that he is not going to... Uh, benefit from the project at the near future he is still making variations and he does not notify the contractor with his intention to apply delay damages as a as a consequence of such a delay so i believe here that there are two uh, two parts uh, the first one uh, uh, and the second one he's making variation at later stage therefore it's apparent that there is no damages on his part he is still enhancing his project for a better benefit. So applying uh, uh, applying delay damages on the contractor or refusing to give him an extension of time and thereafter app uh, applying delay damages, I think it's an act of bad force. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Omar. Uh, Mr. Osama uh, Mantawi. Hello, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, in this case, um, I think the employer doesn't have to give a notification that he's going to apply LDs on the contractor. So in this case, particularly to the direct answer to the question written on the screen right now, no, there is no bad faith. Whether the contractor uh, has caused the damages to the employer or not, it depends on how long was the project delayed due to the contractor's events and how long will it be delayed due to the employer's variation notification or variation instruction. Um, I can give a simple ex example that if I'm in a power generation project and this project should be uh, completed since three months and the contractor is delaying the project, then as an employer, I have a lot of damages to generate power and to sell this power to invest my project. Then since the project is still ongoing and I'm an employer and I have the right to instruct the contractor to do some variations since the TOC has not been issued yet, uh, I ask for a simple variation that takes only one week. 
So uh, extra one week of delay does not eliminate the three months of delay of the contractor. In all cases, I don't have to give the contractor notification that, okay, you are delayed, I will apply liquidated damages uh, because there is nothing in the contract. In this case, I assume that there is nothing in the contract that obliged the contractor, uh, sorry, obliged the employer to give a notification uh, to the contractor that he will apply LDs. And based on the net approach in calculating the, the entitlement, you will be entitled to additional uh, one week of extension of time on the contractual completion date, because at that time you should have been completed the project and this variation takes only one week to complete. And the three months remains, um, the, st the three months duration remains the contractor's responsibility and the owner fully entitled fully entitled to apply liquidated damages. That's my opinion. That's fair enough, definitely, Mr. Usaima, I think, uh, for the apportionment of the damage at the end and, uh, and uh, the responsibility of, of each party. So I fully agree with you. Actually, I would actually also add that, uh, that you mentioned net versus gross, uh, gross, and this is actually, this was another webinar that we also covered uh, yes. because of the, uh, of the debate. Uh, one thing I just want to 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 alert uh, Sir Osama is that in the further contract there is an obligation on the contractor, as as maybe Mr. Omar mentioned in the law, there is, but also in the further contract in '99, clause 2.5 uh, obligates the employer to apply to notify the contractor whenever there's going to be any deduction. Clause 8.7, the liquidated damages says that it is subject to 2.5. So actually, the the employer has to notify the contractor if you're just going with the with the FIDIC contract and actually in 2017 both the uh, even applying damages is subject to clause 20 for the employer so that he has to notify the contractor the key issue here is uh, although i i agree that uh, there's, there's this issue of uh, and as dr Denji mentioned proportionality that can be applied to the liquidated damages but the point that um, i'm raising in this question on the screen is that when the employer issues the variation, then the employer should really uh, give the contractor a clue that you know you're doing this variation, but I will apply damages because, for example, the employer can just simply say, "I am looking at the forecast completion date, not the contractual completion date." For example, that's why in the article that Dr. Ng mentioned, one of the recommendations is that if we're going to use the longest path method or even the net method, why don't we just mention it in the contract? So make it very transparent. And this is actually an act of good faith. Make it part of the agreement. We will apply the net method or the forecast completion, uh, the forecast, uh, the, the uh, longest path theory, for example. So there's no surprises. I mean, this is this is maybe uh, one thing uh, that is uh, is worthy of mentioning. Um, I wanted to to uh, also uh, there is a a, a comment um, in the chat by uh, and I'm sorry if I cannot pronounce the name correctly. Uh, I think it's Panayotis Vasiliadis. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry if I have not pronounce it correctly, but but she's saying if I may, all these are indeed valid viewpoints. Uh, but what happens after good faith signs are confirmed? Does that establish breach of good faith without more? And what remedies are available to the contractor under, for example, a well-coded civil code jurisdiction, more so under a common law jurisdiction? It would be very interesting. You need to have a separate webinar around this topic. Uh, I think you're saying, what if uh, the uh, signs of good faith are violated? So, so, so there's a sign of bad faith. Uh, of course, I think this probably would need a um, a lawyer to to answer this question. But I think, uh, from my my perspective, uh, and I'll also ask Dr. Ng, I would think that if there's a sign of that's contrary to bad faith, that in itself is not lend itself to to a sort of a punishment. But however, if the this bad faith, and if you, as you can see in all these scenarios there's a consequence that can, can cause a harm to one of the parties. And this harm will result in, and this is a, a um, an established principle under the law, that if there's a harm that is caused and that, that in results in compensation. So this is where the link can come, is that if there's a sign of bad faith and that results in harm, then that triggers compensation. So this is 
with, and you're right, this is something that, of course, can be another uh, webinar uh, we can discuss. Uh, Strange, do you have any comments? Uh, I, I, actually, I was going to read the same comment. It was very quite interesting uh, to me as well. And uh, and as we're going to talk again, uh, good faith is a mandatory requirement under the civil code. And uh, if the harm is proven and if there is a damage that's proven, definitely um, a good faith will trigger in. The law would fill the gap what's in the contract and you can claim your damages uh, under the law. So... Um, so definitely, if you have damages that are because of the breach of bad faith, you can start and um, uh, trigger that under the law and ask. Okay, great. We've actually come now to the conclusion of this, this uh, webinar. Uh, we'd like to just con conclude with a few uh, very, very, you can say, uh, very few specific comments. Uh, the first thing is that good faith is a mandatory requirement that should not be overlooked. As we have seen in the in the civil law jurisdiction, as you as you can, in the Egyptian civil law jurisdiction, and actually as we've as you've seen in the long list of MENA region civil code jurisdictions, and as you've seen also in Dr. Ng's presentation of even beyond the MENA region, a good faith is not really uh, something to 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 overlook. It's not an, something to be um, that should be an oversight. It is a mandatory provision. It's there in the law, so it should be complied with. And in the case of 2017, the FIDIC contract. Uh, this advance warning that has now been inside the court, uh, the contract that that should be a uh, that's because that we, we we consider that to be a sign of good faith that is now contractual, and we encourage actually that um, even if we're using the 99, if we're using the 87 edition, why not incorporate this clause into these contracts and the particular conditions so that um, as we have mentioned, uh, putting the project first. And look, thinking of the project's interests, that's really where everyone. This is where it's 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 everyone is a winner. Um, I, I fully agree with you. Definitely, implementation of the good faith in construction can be a win-win to the project stakeholders. It's uh, the good faith is very important uh, for all of the parties and for the project um, at the first place. Yes. Um, it's important in the negotiation stage. It's important in the execution stage. It's important even in arbitration case. And me and Dr. Reed were discussing even how the good faith could be implemented in arbitration. And maybe we can hold another webinar about uh, good faith in arbitrations. But, 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 and we have to think about the win-win situation. It's not like good faith and bad faith to opposite sides, uh, how we can reach a midpoint like uh, a value engineering recommendation or uh, uh, another alternative design. So it's very important that both parties sit together and uh, and have the good faith atmosphere in, uh, in the project. I know sometimes people are saying it's not utopia in construction, uh, but, but really uh, partnering together for the benefit of the project is very important because uh, we're not here to do claims business, neither me or Dr. Valid. Uh, it's really our main objective in our position is to minimize the disputes we want to have a successful project with a minimal cost and uh, definitely not going in, um, in disputes. I fully agree with you, uh, Dr. Ng. And with this note, we would like to thank you all. Uh, actually, I, we, we are very pleased with the level of participation. It actually has exceeded our expectations. Uh, so we, were, we, are thank, we thank you very much for all those who participated. And thank you for being a very attentive uh, audience. Indeed, thank you so much for attending. It was really an um, honor and um, to be with Dr. Walid and definitely to be with such uh, an audience uh, with such participation level. Thank you so much thank and you. looking forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.